My name is Peter. Uh, I'm declaring this uh, Cork Astronomy Club meeting open and uh, I'm chair of Cork Astronomy Club and I wish you all well for 2022. Uh, now, um, we come on to uh, the, the principal feature of tonight's meeting and that is a, a lecture from Dr. Amanda Hendricks. She's actually speaking to us from her home in Colorado. We're, we're, we're delighted to uh, welcome her tonight. And in fact, we're very privileged that she should have joined us. And we're grateful for the time that uh, she's devoting to talking to us tonight. Most of you will be aware that any sp spacecraft bound for Mars has to be thoroughly cleaned before launch. And this applies to other destinations that may be hospitable to life. And that's all called planetary protection. Um, the aim is to prevent microbes from Earth establishing a foothold on Mars and elsewhere and maybe interfering with experiments searching for life. Uh, you'll perhaps also know that there's been some debate about this process because it adds so much expense to the cost of uh, sending uh, miss missions to Mars. And uh, Dr. Hendricks is uh, thoroughly immersed in this debate and indeed has uh, co-authored an important report recently. And she's uh, kindly agreed to uh, come and tell us about her views uh, tonight. Um, I can tell you that uh, Amanda has been part of many planetary science missions, including the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and Cassini, where she was deputy project scientist. And she's now currently a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, which is based in Tucson, Arizona. But as I say, she joins us tonight from Colorado. So Amanda, Cork Astronomy Club is privileged to be able to welcome you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the invitation. As Peter was mentioning, um, the science that I normally do is has to do with uh, moons in the solar system and small bodies like asteroids. And typically, I'll use uh, ultraviolet and visible spectroscopy uh, to study the the uh, surfaces of these objects. Um, so I am, frankly, not very well versed in ground based astronomy, as you all are, <laughs> because the, the uh, facilities that I normally use for my ultraviolet spectroscopy are space based. But um, I'm here to talk to you with sort of a different hat on as the uh, co-chair of the Committee on Planetary Protection, which is sort of um, a parallel to the to the normal research that I do, but um, is very interesting. And um, so I'll talk about a recent report that we've put out, and I'm happy to um, take questions as we go along or um, as, as we finish up here. Um, so the Committee on Planetary Protection is a committee of the Space Studies Board of the National Academies, and it's actually kind of unique because it's not just a committee of the Space Studies Board, but it's a, a joint committee with the Board on Life Sciences and the Aeronautics and Space Engineering Board. And this is somewhat unique uh, among National Academies committees and, and reflects the kind of um, broad um, and complex nature of planetary protection in general. It's a committee that was just stood up in late 2019, no, late 2020. Uh, we first did a report on planetary protection on the moon. And then our second report was um, this one that I'm gonna talk to you about, about Mars. The committee is made up of 15 members, experts in um, international law, uh, various types of planetary science, engineering, planetary protection policy. Uh, we have a representative from ESA, and we have three members who uh, have experience in the private sector, which is particularly important for our work because a lot of our work has to do with the emergence of commercial players in um, planetary protection missions. Now, I just wanted to give a, a quick overview of planetary protection categories uh, for Mars robotic missions. As Peter mentioned, the whole idea of planetary protection is to avoid harmful contamination, 
meaning that we want to preserve the integrity of future astrobiological investigations on Mars or whatever body we're concerned with. All robotic missions to Mars right now are categorized as category four. And there are um, also um, for other targets in the solar system, missions that are categorized as category one, two, three, and five. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about those too, but all Mars missions right now that are uh, robotic missions are category four. Um, or category four can be applied to missions to other targets too, because it, it really applies to bodies of significant is interest to a process of chemical evolution and or origin of life, where scientific opinion provides a sig significant chance that contamination could compromise future investigations. Okay, so that's Mars. And the category four missions at Mars are subdivided into cat four A, B and C. The CAT 4A missions are those that uh, are not carrying instruments that are interested in searching for life. Examples include Pathfinder, which you might remember, the MER missions, um, and uh, MSL, Curiosity, <clears throat> and also Insight. The CAT 4B missions are missions that are carrying instruments designed to search for extant Martian life. Uh, Mars 2020. Uh, and Phoenix are examples of Cat 4B missions. And then Cat 4C missions are those going to what's called special regions on Mars, uh, even if they're not carrying life detection instrumentation, such as the Viking landers. And special regions I'll talk about more a little bit later, but these are regions where the conditions might um, be, um, for instance, the water conditions might permit um, proliferation of life. Now, this report that I'm talking to you about mainly deals with the CAT 4A missions. Um, and this is because CAT 4B and even CAT 4C missions typically, especially if you're, if you're uh, designing a mission to go and search for life on Mars, um, the cleanliness standards that you need to adhere to to make sure that you do your job right in terms of searching for life are actually probably going to exceed any planetary protection cleanliness requirements. So really what we're talking about in this report is mainly the CAT 4A missions. This is a wordy slide, but um, you know, the National Academies typically provides advice to federal agencies and um, typically the Committee on Planetary Protection has gotten uh, uh, charged uh, by NASA with writing these reports. And so NASA will give us a task with a statement of task um, that they want us to address. And our statement of task for this report, um, all of the different things that they wanted us to hit on are, are covered here in the bullet points. Um, but the main idea is that they wanted us to consider the criteria and the locations on Mars for which bio burden requirements might be relaxed. And what I mean by bio re burden requirements is the requirements, the basically the cleanliness standards. To what level do the uh, spacecraft and all the components need to be cleaned? And the question is really, do we need to go through rigorous sterilization uh, procedures if a mission is not actually searching for life on Mars, and it's not going to any place on Mars where there's liable to be uh, extant life, or even uh, a place on Mars where, where there's not a, a high likelihood that life could proliferate. Um, and, in, and especially in light of new non-NASA players becoming more active like commercial entities, this, this becomes a question because there is at least a perception that um, planetary protection procedures and requirements can become quite rigorous and onerous. So we were charged with identifying the criteria, um, especially um, considering temperature and water activity, namely the kind of the range of conditions under which um, water is available and in a liquid state these criteria that could be used to determine locations or regions on Mars that could be potentially suitable 
um, for missions of less restrictive bio burden than the current category four missions are. Uh, we were to consider whether such mission activities need to be constrained within a particular um, area. Uh, we need to consider off nominal um, operations, such as basically um, if a mission ends up landing in a region where it didn't intend or ends up crashing. Um, and what methods, what types of observations or modeling might be done to, um, to show that a mission meets these criteria. Um, and we were asked to come up um, with some potentially acceptable specific regions. And we also were asked to look at potential, we were just asked to look briefly um, at um, whether any of those uh, locations might be suitable for future human uh, exploration missions. And we were asked to take into account the views of the broad community of stakeholders, including government agencies, uh, the aerospace industry, and these emerging commercial en entities. And so in doing so, you know, what we typically do for these reports is get expert opinions, expertise from the stakeholders. Uh, we'll have them come in and give us talks and we can take um, those views into account in our reports. So some of the important considerations in considering planetary protection, given that um, we're concerned with harmful contamination, um, meaning that we're concerned with the delivery of terrestrial microorganisms, biological material uh, that could compromise or, or confound future search for life, life measurements. Uh, what we wanted to consider was the likelihood of contamination by delivery of terrestrial microbes, um, the likelihood of survival, um, the likelihood of proliferation, and also transport across the surface by, for instance, wind. Tra um, translating that into the actual risk of harmful contamination uh, is what we considered. Um, and we focused in these first um, top four bullets on proliferation, because be, um, since we are mainly concerned with the risk of harmful contamination, we considered that proliferation of terrestrial microorganisms, uh, rather than just uh, survival, for instance, uh, is the real risk where harmful contamination comes in. And the main factors that we considered, um, in other words, the Martian conditions uh, that we considered that would affect microbial survivability and especially growth and proliferation are the temperature. We know that it's very cold on Mars, um, the amount of water and the desiccation, um, it's very dry on Mars. Uh, we know that there was water, liquid water on the surface uh, in the past, but there is not currently, it's very dry. Um, and we also considered the composition um, and density of the atmosphere and sources of nutrients and energy. And also, as I mentioned before, the, the wind, uh, what we know about the wind and tra potential transport of terrestrial microbes across the surface, given what we know about the wind. So I'm gonna walk you through our report and our findings. So what we can do as a committee is technically we cannot provide recommendations to NASA, but we can provide findings. Um, and NASA can use those um, findings um, then as they wish and as advice. So in chapter one, um, it just kind of provides an overview and introduction. We discussed previous related reports and we presented our st statement of task and our charter. Chapter two was kind of a foundational chapter because we considered why we're even concerned with planetary protection on Mars, um, the astrobiological possibilities on Mars, and why are we even thinking about this? If, if um, the, the proliferation of terrestrial life or the existence of Martian uh, life is not viable, then we don't need to probably be concerned about planetary protection. But the fact is that we've had five plus decades of exploration on Mars. 
Um, we know um, we've had a lot of study of um, how life arose on earth and we know that it may have uh, arisen very quickly and require liquid water. Um, we may know that life may have arisen very early in, in the history of earth. And so if that um, situation arose on Mars, um, then there could be extant life on Mars and or extinct life that we, of which we can find evidence. Um, some of the Viking era measurements uh, are kind of controversial enough that there's continuing discussion of them. And so there's a, um, a feeling and um, a concern in the planetary community that um, Mars is, is a relevant destination for searching for extinct, extinct and or extant life. Um, and we've got to be very careful about harmful contamination. So the, the main finding though, out of uh, chapter one is that um, of course, discovery of indigenous life on Mars would be absolutely um, critical uh, to human knowledge. And there is some question about whether um, terrestrial microorganisms can be distinguished from any indigenous Martian uh, microorganisms. And so we've got to preserve the unambiguous separation of, of that distinguishability. And the way that we do that is through planetary protection protocols. So this number one finding establishes basically the framework for our proposal and establishes the uh, criticality of the rest of our findings. In chapter three, we dig into the considerations for um, reducing bio burden requirements. How are we gonna do this? Um, first of all, we considered the conditions on Mars. Um, how does life as we know it um, survive in extreme environments on earth? And so therefore how, how might it uh, survive in some of these conditions on Mars? Uh, what are the conditions for survival and proliferation and then also transport of terrestrial biota on Mars? And given, and we go through all of the uh, evidence for what we know about Mars conditions, given that we know that it's very cold, um, it's very dry, and especially that uh, there isn't a lot of atmosphere on Mars. So the radiation environment at the surface is very harsh, uh, especially the UV, but also the galactic cosmic rays. And the galactic cosmic rays affect down to about 10 centimeters depth. Uh, but at the surface, we're considered, um, we are concerned primarily with the UVC uh, radiation. Given those factors, the coldness, the dryness, the radiation environment at the surface of Mars, the survival, uh, growth, and proliferation of terrestrial microorganisms, or even suspended in the atmosphere, highly unlikely uh, as a source of harmful contamination. Uh, however, given what we know about the possibilities for transport across the surface and into potential subsurface environments, and we know that there's wind on Mars. We know that there are caves, for instance, and I'll talk more about those. Um, that is where the committee uh, concluded that there's the real risk of harmful contamination is in the subsurface and the possible transport of terrestrial microbes to the subsurface. Okay, so the next thing we talked about in chapter three was the special regions. Um, now, special regions on Mars, as I... Um, mentioned before are places where uh, the conditions might be conducive for life. Okay, there have been special regions considered um, on the surface of Mars. One type of special region uh, that's considered by the community are called uh, recurring slope lineae, RSLs. And these were spotted on the surface and, and they're like these linear features that seem to grow with the seasons and they appear and disappear. And there was some question about whether they were created by uh, liquids. The committee heard about RSLs from experts and uh, came to the conclusion that they were, they're probably actually a dry phenomenon, perhaps um, created by movement of dry sand. Um, 
So we focused instead more on the special regions of caves. And they're, of course, in the subsurface. So there's no surface special regions that we spent um, too much time on. But we know from um, high-rise imagery um, from, from orbit that there are probably about 1,200 that we know of now cave openings um, on the surface. These are regions uh, that we know from what we know about caves on Earth, where the environment might be quite stable. Um, it might be cold. Well, we don't know what the temperature conditions are like in caves, but it's probably stable, uh, stable temperatures. And the kind of critical thing about caves is that they're going to be um, some depth below the surface. And so that harsh radiation environment at the surface is not going to be present in the caves. So these are regions that are, are likely to be shielded from the radiation. And caves on Mars are likely um, to be significantly larger than they are on Earth, mainly um, in volcanic regions on Mars, so related to lava tubes. And so they're there are a lot of these um, caves on Mars that, that we um, know about, cave openings, but we don't know very much about them. We don't actually know um, what the conditions are like in the caves. All we can do is kind of guess based on um, knowledge from Earth caves. But we know that there's about 1,200 openings. So it's kind of analogous to um, skylights in lava tubes on Earth, cave openings. Um, about 1,200 of them, and that's only from um, imaging 2 or 3% of the surface um, from high-rise in its highest resolution mode. So um, there's a lot we don't know about where these cave openings might be and how numerous they are. So um, the third finding that we had was that kind of linked to the second finding a little bit. Some regions of the Martian subsurface appear to be the most promising places uh, for finding potentially extant life, um, Martian life, and also maybe for providing Earth microorganisms with um, conditions uh, that could support their proliferation. But we don't know very much about them. Okay. And then also in chapter three, um, we got into the actual criteria for landing sites where reduced bio burden might be acceptable, given that we just talked about how the surface is very inhospitable, uh, but there are potentially habitable regions in the subsurface, but we don't know very much about them. Um, you know, where, where are we going to find some landing sites where we might be able to have reduced bio burden? Uh, and how are we going to validate those criteria? Well, what we decided is that um, it, it's largely going to depend on where the water is. Uh, and where we think the water is and how, um, what the water activity is going to be like. And it's also going to depend on how interconnected uh, subsurface units might be, because there could be, uh, first of all, there could be water on the surface, frozen water. There could be water in the subsurface. There could be water in the subsurface in brine channels uh, that can help um, increase the water activity. Um, and we don't know about the interconnectedness of those brine channels. So if there is a pocket of water that is not connected to anything else, and it's just kind of by itself, um, that is a place where uh, earth microorganisms might not proliferate. They might be able to survive there, uh, protected from the surface radiation environment, if they had water and nutrients. Uh, but if there's nothing out, there's no interconnectedness, they're not going to be able to proliferate and they're not going to end up um, harmfully contaminating a future experiment. Um, but if there are brine channels in the subsurface, for instance, these are, these are examples of interconnected networks that we're concerned about in the subsurface. So our, our criteria for landing sites has a lot to do with where the water is. And I'm going to show you a map, and then we can come back to some of this, these findings. Uh, here's a map. Now, this is based on the most recent data from infrared and neutron spectroscopy um, of the surface of Mars. And this covers 60 south to 60 north. Um, 
And what this shows you is where we think the water is in the top meter of the surface. Um, the gray, and this uh, you'll see in the legend, this refers to WEH, which is water equivalent hydrogen. Um, all those gray areas, so largely kind of equator word of about 30 degrees latitude, maybe a little bit more, but not uh, entirely within those latitudes. Uh, we think that there's very little water in the top meter. Um, but kind of that purpley periwinkle color, we do think that there is um, water, but maybe little data. So we need to be careful about those. And also um, in these gray areas, uh, we don't think there's very much water in the top meter, but um, if there is, it's likely to be discontinuous or in um, areas of not interconnected networks, like I was mentioning. So um, where connectivity is limited, we're going to preclude much of the um, proliferation that we're concerned about. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to show you on here is all of these black dots. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the black dots over here, and there's a few over here. These are some of those 1200 cave openings that we know about based on high rise imagery. Uh, they're all, a lot of them, I said, mostly they're volcanic in nature. They're clustered in here around the Tharsis region. Um, there could be other uh, cave openings elsewhere that we have not seen yet in the um, high-rise imagery. Based on this map of where we know the water is and based on our knowledge of the surface environment um, <clears throat> and the sterilizing conditions, of the Martian surface, the committee concluded, and this kind of summarizes the three findings um, on the previous slide mostly. The committee concluded that bio burden requirements could be relaxed if the following criteria are met. The mission activities would not include surface subsurface activities. So no drilling or digging. Uh, or if you if you do want to dig or drill down to a meter, uh, you have to go to a landing site where there's there's no water that we know of. So one of the gray areas in that map that I showed you. But importantly, if you just want to stay on the surface or if you want to um, dig but go to um, an area where we don't think there's very much ice, um, it's important to stay a conservative distance away from any of those cave openings that we know about now. Because um, if any terrestrial microbes end up getting transported to one of those cave openings, we don't know what's going to happen. So we just don't know enough to, um, to say, okay, bio burden requirements uh, ought to be reduced and you can land next to a cave opening. We just don't know enough. And so uh, we wanna be cautious. Um, so we recommend a buffer distance, and we recommend that the buffer distance of the landing site from any cave openings um, be determined based on um, the season and the known wind conditions, um, because um, and and the latest models of um, of you know wind conditions on Mars because these evolve. We did a, an example calculation in our report. Um, given a, uh, an average wind speed, which has been um, determined from several landers of about 10 meters per second. Um, and given that uh, we know that uh, from the UVC environment on the surface, terrestrial microbes are not going to survive. A, a conservative estimate is that they wouldn't last more than more than one or two sols, more than one or two Martian days. So if we said, okay, let's say in 15 hours, how um, far could a terrestrial microbe be transported by a 10 meter per second wind? Uh, and we came up with about 600 kilometers, uh, which is a pretty big uh, buffer distance that we'd say, okay, a, a mission that um, wants to meet lower cleanliness standards, Need, would need to land uh, from any known cave opening. 
But again, that's just kind of, that was just sort of an example estimate that we did, an example calculation. And, and we would, we found, we concluded that any um, mission that wanted to have lower bio burden requirements ought to figure out um, under the guidance of the NASA Planetary Protection Office, um, what those conditions are and what that distance ought to be. Okay, now we then went on to say, um, now what we didn't end up doing is um, actually saying what these reduced bio burden requirements need to be. So um, what a lot of the bio burden requirements um, say right now is, oh, you need to have um, fewer than so many spores per square meter on your spacecraft. Um, and and we, didn't, we didn't say that, but what we did say is that you cannot not clean your spacecraft if you wanna, um, even if you stay more than 600 or however many kilometers away from a cave opening and don't land where there's any water, you still need, to clean your spacecraft uh, to some level. And it's probably something like uh, aerospace industry standards uh, would do um, because of all of the uncertainty that we still have about the surface of Mars. Uh, and because we don't know where all the cave openings are, for instance, um, there, there does need to be some cleanliness uh, requirements on Mars missions, but it doesn't have to be as rigorous as current um, category 4A, for instance. But what we're advocating is that um, is not a free for all in terms of um, anybody can send uh, a mission to Mars and, and with no, no cleanliness requirements. That we think we're, we're trying to avoid. But we do think that it can help um, with lower cleanliness requirements um, open up uh, access a little bit uh, and help enable some uh, co commercial entities to um, have a go at landing on Mars. Now, in chapter four, um, then we went on to discuss um, alternatives to current planetary protection uh, implementation techniques. And in particular, what we talked about was uh, risk, um, risk management approach and also some post landing approaches to planetary protection. So um, the current planetary protection uh, requirements of NASA rely primarily on pre-launch cleanliness and spore count measurements. Um, they're not that flexible and we wanted to try to come up with um, some flexibility. Um, and um, so we, we decided that uh, using a risk management approach as an alternative um, is one way of opening up uh, flexibility for planetary protection implementation. Um, and also in situ or post landing, bio burden reduction could provide a, a cost-effective alternative. Um, things like utilizing the, that you know, harmful radiation, um, that that I talked about on the surface. It's not very um, pleasant for terrestrial microorganisms. Um, and that could be used um, to emissions advantage if you wanna do some um, in situ sterilization. So for risk management, let me just say a few more words about this. And this is used very often in, um, for in, in other areas of NASA and in the aerospace industry and, and so forth, um, but just hasn't been used so far too much in planetary protection. But the idea is that once planetary protection requirements for a mission are, are established, so once you know, okay, I'm going to go to one of those gray areas on the map, I'm going to stay far away from a cave opening, um, so I, I want to have lower bio burden requirements, how am I going to do this? Um, a mission um, might identify what are the stressors? Uh, how might a mission produce harmful contamination? Uh, what are the situations? Um, and then assess the likelihood and consequence of those possibilities and those can um, combine to assess the risk um, in step three. And those risks then can be uh, ranked from low to high. Um, and 
And then in step four, you can identify um, the pre-launch or as I mentioned, in situ methods that can be used to mitigate the risks above a certain threshold. So maybe you wanna have everything um, below a low or medium risk. Um, so in the next slide is kind of an example. This is a um, simplified example of a, an, a risk matrix uh, where you've got the consequence across the x-axis and likelihood in the y. Um, and if you've got kind of a, in the lower right-hand corner, You've got a green, you've got a low likelihood, low consequence. Uh, this is for a situation where maybe you are, um, you're, you've decided to just sterilize your lander, um, you're landing at a site of absolutely no astrobiological interest. Um, that's gonna be a low, low um, risk. But in, in contrast, um, if you are in the upper right, with a high likelihood and um, high consequence, that's maybe if you were um, maybe not a robotic mission at all. Maybe you're taking a human, very dir dirty human, <laughs> uh, and you're going to um, some site where maybe you know that there's clay deposits and there's um, ex you know possibly the presence of extinct life there, or maybe you're going nearby a cave opening. Um, so that you'd want to. Um, take steps to um, reduce the likelihood and reduce the consequence there. And maybe you could do tailored, um, you know, the, the planetary protection implementation could be tailored for your situation. So make it a little bit more flexible than it currently is. Okay, for category 4A, um, there could be missions according to our report, that satisfy the criteria for reduced bioburden requirements. Like I mentioned, maybe they're going to one of those gray areas. Um, the requirements might be um, based on industry standards. Uh, they don't necessarily have to follow uh, the NASA or Coast Bar requirements. Uh, and they could use the uh, risk matrix to um, mitigate the risks. If they're assessed as a uh, cat 4 a uh, but they don't end up reducing or satisfying the criteria, um, they might just have to go ahead and uh, follow the Coast Bar and NASA criteria, um, and um, and and maybe that's maybe that uh, that has worked, you know, for for a couple of decades now, and that's fine. But category four B, as I mentioned, these are life detection missions. Um, and because of their scientific requirements, they're going to apply contamination measures that are going to be more stringent than uh, any planetary protection requirements. So that's really not applicable for our report as much. And um, similarly for CAT 4C, if you're going to a special region like to a cave, um, that you're not going to qualify for reduced bio burden requirements. Um, so, so as I said, we're mostly uh, focused on Cat 4A missions going to regions where there's not going to be a lot of water ice present, as far as we know, and you're not going to be close to um, a subsurface access point. Um, and those are those are missions that we think we might be able to reduce bio burden requirements and still remain pretty cautious about uh, preserving the integrity integrity of future um, search for life um, experiments on Mars. So that kind of summarizes our report and I'll leave it there. Um, I think my 40 minutes is pretty much up and I'd be happy to take any questions when people are ready. So now if Amanda is ready and if uh, Declan and Dorothea are ready, uh, we can uh, start calling the questions. And in fact, I think uh, I'll start off myself Amanda, which I often do, kind of abusing my position as the chair here, you, you place some weight on radiation uh, to um, um, eradicate microbes, including using it as a kind of uh, in situ sterilization technique. But uh, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, microbes on Earth have been found to be extremely resistant to radiation, <laughs> even living in nuclear reactors, as I've heard, and down the bottom of gold mines, for that matter. And I'm just wondering um, what weight you've placed on uh, the 
capacity of radiation to eradicate microbes. And another thing which I was curious about was that you mentioned that microbes, and I, I don't know whether I heard you right here, but, but you said that microbes would only survive on Mars for two souls. And I, w I was wondering how you, how you came to that conclusion. Okay, right. Good questions. Um, I didn't go into very much detail uh, in my words on that, but we do in the report more. We considered what we know about the resistance of terrestrial microbes to radiation, including some of those very rad hard ones, like I think are the ones that you are um, referring to. We have, I'm not an expert on some of these microbes, but we have experts on the committee who are, but Deinococcus, uh, something is one of the ones that I think is the most uh, rad hard and um, under, and I guess enough experiments on earth have been done under different radiation environments that an ex extrapolation can be done for the uh, UVC flux that we know from MSL measurements at the surface of Mars, which is um, depending on season and latitude and, um, you know, the dust conditions in the atmosphere uh, can be something like two watts per meter squared. And under that kind of radiation environment um, um, uh, for a particular um, type of microbe, even a rad hard one, that's where we came up with the maximum of one to two sols uh, that it could um, survive. That's with no, um, things could be um, modified some depending on the, um, amount of shielding that might be provided by dust, for instance, de depending on the amount of shielding that might be uh, provided by little crevices in the surface or on the spacecraft. Um, however, that is thinking about UVC alone. And what we didn't get into, because it gets very complicated and out of kind of the scope of our report, is the UVC and plus gamma ray, plus the desiccating environment, plus the, um, um, you know, the presence of oxidants, for instance, uh, all of those things combined together are probably uh, going to um, compound the kind of biocidal uh, conditions on the surface. So we just sort of uh, considered the desiccating environment, the um, the radiation environment, um, for instance, the cold on its on their own, uh, but combined together, um, it's liable to make things even worse for terrestrial organisms. Um, but so so we did uh, consider, I think, Peter, um, the hardiness of some of the terrestrial microbes that we know about to radiation. Uh, but but the fact that there is a lot of UVC coming into the Martian surface, um, unimpeded by a significant atmosphere, um, is is pretty pretty biocidal at the surface there. Uh, Declan, Dor Dorothea, I'll hand over to you now to uh, uh, okay. take uh, take the other questions. Okay, um, I'll just go through a few first, and we'll hand over to Dorothea then. Um, first question from Tim Jackson, Amanda. You've kind of covered it all already to a certain extent. And um, his question is, is space travel in vacuum for weeks, or in the case of Mars, it would be months, mm -hmm. and not lethal to terrestrial organisms anyway? Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And that is uh, one of the, not really in situ, but it, it could be applied as sort of a credit uh, for missions if they wanted to, um, potentially, depending on the situation, as a um, uh, bio burden reduction technique. I mean, yes, traveling to Mars, traveling to, you know, Europa, wherever you're going, you have to consider that your spacecraft is going to be in space for months um, and that that's a um, harsh environment out there. Um, now, probably only the any terrestrial microbes that are exposed to it are going to uh, be damaged as a result. Uh, but e yes, that, that could be used as, um, again, as kind of a credit um, for missions in, in assessing their um, bio burden 
requirements. Okay. Mick McCreevy is wondering, we're still finding fossils here on Earth over 67 million years old and further back. Uh, do we have any idea as yet if there was life on Mars? When did it die out? Or mm. do we think it was ever only microscopic? Mm. Right, that's a good question. Um, I think that they're, they're um, we didn't, first of all, I'll say we didn't get into that in our report very mm. much. Yeah. Uh, what, we, what we talked about was um, the likelihood that there could be extant life in some habitable zone on Mars, likely in the subsurface, or whether there could be extinct life. And again, we didn't get into how old it might be or when it might've died off or what form it might've been in. But I think the um, common line of thinking is that it would be in, in kind of a microbial form, uh, which is the concern, as I mentioned, because if it is in a microbial form and we can't distinguish it from terrestrial microbes, uh, even if it is extinct, we still want to know that it's there and we want to know that it's Martian in origin and be able to distinguish it from terrestrial microorganisms. Okay. Uh, John Bowen asks a question which was going through my own mind, actually. Um, should this whole area be governed by a UN body so that mm -hmm. all countries who engage in space exploration should be bound by similar rules in this regard? And I was thinking, I mean, we have there's a Chinese rover currently on Mars, and um, do they, or how do we know that they right. um, applied the same standards? Right, that's a good question. That's very interesting. And there is a body called COSPAR, which is a committee on space research. And COSPAR has um, lots of member nations, including the Chinese, um, that participate in the activities of its planetary protection panel, the PPP. And they are charged with um, kind of, um, let's see, was they, uh, I'm gonna look at my notes. They maintain and promulgate planetary protection policy uh, for reference of spacefaring nations um, in order to guide compliance to the Outer Space Treaty, which was ratified by 110 nations. So the Outer Space Treaty is a UN um, treaty. Um, it's the, um, it's the United Nations Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. That's the long word for the Outer Space Treaty. Um, and Article 9 of the Outer Space Treaty is the key one for planetary protection. Um, this is uh, parties to the treaty shall pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination and also adverse changes in the environment of the earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial matter, dot, dot, dot. So this is article nine of the outer space treaties to which many nations have signed up, you know, to comply with it. And COSPAR is the body that kind of uh, helps um, establish the guidelines um, to, to uh, promote the adherence to that treaty. Um, now, the Planetary Protection Office, as part of NASA, um, is charged with ensuring compliance uh, for NASA related missions, uh, any missions that have, that's a NASA mission or has Na NASA instrumentation on it. Um, but um, in terms of ensuring compliance, um, that's, that's pretty much, I believe, up to the actual um, Coast Bar member nations. You know, if they're, if they're going to the planetary protection uh, panel meetings and, um, you know, participating in, um, you know, discussion of the guidelines and so forth. Um, there is some expectation that they're um, actually adhering to the planetary protection um, implementation policies um, that are, that are um, kind of overseen by Coast Bar. Okay. Um, and by the way, I, that, that reminds me that I, I mentioned that the um, 
Committee on Planetary Protection that I co-chair, we're mainly concerned with um, harm, harmful contamination um, of other of other worlds. Um, but the other half, that's um, back contamination, but forward contamination, sorry, that's forward contamination. Back contamination is when um, extraterrestrial contamination can be brought back to Earth. And so far, we haven't been concerned with that as a committee, but that is the other sort of half of the planetary protection issue. Yeah. Uh, Tom Thompson is asking a question which covers a couple of other comments as well, so I'll roll them all into one, which says, I presume that it is cost that is driving these criteria, Mm. and what are the costs involved? Um, There are also some other comments about um, light touch and especially where you have private enterprise coming into it, you know, is, is this a good idea? So the, the question of expense is a good one um, because it turns out that there's, it's, it's difficult. And we, cause we have asked uh, to attach a dollar figure to um, all of the planetary protection implementation for any particular mission. Um, you know, we have asked, how much of a burden is it actually to clean your spacecraft? Is it really that much of an onerous thing? Um, is it really that much of your budget? You know, that's, that is, I think, a valid question. Why not just do it? And then we don't have to worry about, you know, changing the uh, requirements. Um, or is it just a perception? Is it just that um, there's a lack of communication about what the requirements are and people are just don't really understand and so they think it's going to be hard and expensive and maybe it's not actually that bad. So I think there is some of that still there. Um, but there are numbers floated around like maybe maybe uh, up to 10% of emission costs. I think that could be a little on the high end is devoted to planetary protection depending on on what kind of um, mission you're tackling. Um, 10% could be pretty significant, of course, if it is that much. Um, But I think um, the the question of perception is is important also and communication of what the policies are. Okay, Okay, Dorothea, over to you. Thanks, Stefan. Gary asks, we, we asked this before uh, in a different way, but um, Gary asks, what evidence is there that microorganisms actually survive the journey to Mars? Is there actual evidence that hmm. that could happen? Oh, I see. Right. Um, so the, perhaps there's rad hard microorganisms um, that could survive the journey don't know um, if they if they were um, on the outside of the spacecraft uh, but more of a concern is if there's any microbe or terrestrial microbes within the um, spacecraft so shielded during the journey uh, from the space environment but then once um, the lander lands and um, the um, the part of the spacecraft that was shielded, um, within a fairing, for instance, um, during the trip from Earth to Mars, um, once that's exposed um, to the Mars environment, then it would, you know, potentially still have survived the journey. Did I answer that question? So, so there could be portions of the spacecraft that could harbor terrestrial microorganisms that are not um, you know, killed off on the journey to Mars because they're shielded within the spacecraft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, no, uh, Tom says that he finds this very alarming, this report, uh, and it's kind of attached to a question from Moira, which says, do we have the right to reduce standards? Uh, mm-hmm. She says, remember the diseases that Europeans introduced to the Americas. Yeah. Uh, depleting the numbers of indigenous populations. Is there not a moral imperative to maintain the highest of standards? Have we learned anything from history? Uh, yep. Um, no, that's a that's a provocative and interesting and valid question. Um, of course, we as a 
a committee are trying to be as cautious as possible. Um, there are there are some out there who would declare Mars's environment is super harsh. Obviously, there's no life there. Let's just go. Why do we need planetary protection requirements at all? But there's enough evidence that we know of as scientists and from exploring it for for decades that uh, lead us to wonder um, if life could have evolved there and uh, if there could be uh, habitable environments. And so we wanna do our part to protect those uh, and to be cautious enough to um, make sure that uh, cleanliness standards are upheld uh, as much as we can for future missions. So we're definitely, um, Definitely trying to be cautious. And on that uh, note, Stanley asks uh, if you could expand on the role of the commercial entities in your endeavors in terms of their selection, role, and risks of involving the private enterprises. So we were asked to take the private um, commercial entities um, you know, opinions and uh, expertise into account, um, which was kind of easier said than done, actually. We didn't get too much feedback from the commercial entities. We, we invited um, different companies to come and give us their, their thoughts on, um, you know, how onerous is planetary protection, actually, uh, what are you thinking? Um, and we did not get too much feedback, to be honest. Um, presumably because uh, private companies maybe are keeping their plans close to their chest. Um, I don't know. But um, so we just had to kind of continue on and, and um, just try to use the, use the best information that we have uh, from NASA missions, uh, from the science, from the modeling, about uh, what we know about Mars and more importantly, what we don't know about Mars um, so that we can try to, um, you know, maintain high standards for future missions, whether they're commercial or NASA or other space agencies. Uh, now, Colm's asking, uh, has the launch of the James Webb telescope affected the debate on planetary pr protection? Uh, for example, if life was found on Mars, we would know mm. to focus James Webb on Mars like exoplanets. Yeah, well, I mean, James Webb will do great for looking at exoplanets, even for looking at uh, some targets in the solar system. It's going to do great. Um, I don't know how much it's going to do on Mars. Um, but I mean, for advancing our um, knowledge about exoplanets and where you know, there could be habitable environments in uh, exoplanetary systems or in uh, our solar system, uh, it'll be important. You know, um, as you all know, a lot of the um, emphasis on habitability and uh, astrobiology um, has kind of shifted in our solar system from Mars to, you know, ocean worlds like Europa and Enceladus in the outer solar system. Um, as maybe being harbors of extant life, because we know that there's liquid water there. Whereas on uh, Mars, it's more of a question about whether liquid water could ever be stable uh, currently. Uh, but certainly it used to be um, stable on the surface of Mars, liquid water that is. And so, you know, the shift, I'd say the focus has shifted a little bit on Mars um, to thinking about extinct life, rather than extant, uh, but the, the possibility of caves and the possibility of habitable subsurface environments on Mars for extant life is still very, very real, I think. Uh, I was actually interested myself, what did the models kind of show what kind of temperatures would be in the caves on Mars? Would it be, you know, like right. on Earth, it's approximately whatever, five degrees throughout the year? Right. Uh, um, like. I'm trying to remember the, the, it could be, there's, there's, there's varying numbers out there from the models. Um, there's some models that 
claim that it could be too cold in the caves for life. Um, but I think that there's enough uncertainty there. And, and if it's too cold and, and it's a stable environment, then it's never going to be too warm for life. But I think the question is whether um, it's ever kind of a, you know, kind of a mid range um, acceptable temperature for maybe even liquid water or maybe even um, just um, microbes that are very comfortable in or can exist and proliferate in, you know, extremely cold environments. Mm. A lot of work to be done. And that's an active uh, field of study is Martian caves and what their environments might be like. Amanda, I think we've trespassed on your time long enough. Uh, I, 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 I suspect that there are uh, more questions that people in the audience would like to put, but I think we have to call a halt to it somewhere. And I'm going to call the halt to it here because I did say I'd close the meeting around nine o'clock. Now, Amanda, you are co-chair of the Committee on Planetary Protection, and you're working at the highest level of space policy formulation, and we're extremely privileged that you've interrupted your working day to uh, talk to us tonight and give us insights that we really couldn't have got from anywhere else. So um, if you will all uh, uh, like to unmute your microphones, we can... Uh, uh, thank uh, Amanda in the uh, traditional way. Thank you, Amanda. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I well, enjoyed being here and meeting we're, everyone. We're absolutely delighted you could join us. And uh, if, uh, as you said before the meeting began, you do ever uh, uh, bend your steps to Ireland, then please do come and visit us in Cork. We'd only be too delighted to meet up with you. I will do. That would be great fun. I'd love to come visit. <laughs>